when to accept a 3% down offer. The first topic we're going to discuss is when to accept a 3% down offer. Now, a lot of people might think, Mark, you're crazy for even bringing that topic up. We are in a hot seller's market here on Long Island. And who in the world would want to accept a 3% down offer? Well, there, believe it or not, there are certain times when that might be the offer that can net you the most money. We are going to go over, Quentin and I, how you can actually make sure that you're taking the, uh, I guess, doing your best due diligence to make sure that is the best offer on the table. It might net you maybe just to pick a number out, 20,000 more dollars and 20,000 more dollars is 20,000 more dollars. So how do we go about evaluating the offer? Well, the first thing is I wouldn't even consider it unless it is one of the strongest offers on the table. So we're gonna go through how to evaluate a strong offer. Number one, it is one of the highest offers. If it's a real low ball offer, then it's really not something you wanna consider. Number two, it is backed by a strong pre-approval and Quentin's gonna go over what that is uh, in a little while. Three, it, there's nothing attached to it. You got the best terms. Sometimes people present offers on the table and there's a lot of baggage attached to it. And we'll go over that in a little more detail momentarily. And four, the agent or the homeowner, if you're selling your house on your own, has the ability to get in, in contact with the mortgage banker. And that is a very, very important thing. You can get a piece of paper, piece of paper that says pre-approval, but if you can't back that pre-approval up by calling the mortgage banker or mortgage broker and say, does uh, you know so-and-so, did they just furnish a pre-approval, then it's not worth the paper that it's written on. There has to be a direct line of communication with the mortgage person to make sure that offer is actually a valid offer. And lastly, proof of funds. In this market, in this seller's market, homes are selling, houses are selling for at asking or above. So you can run into a big, big problem with appraisals. So how do you know whether or not that appraisal clause is going to knock the offer off or reduce the dollar amount later on? So first, I'm going to have Quentin, even though I gave a little uh, intro, tell everybody who he is, what he does. So Quentin Hardy, it's all yours. Okay. Well, my name is Quentin Hardy. I am a mortgage loan originator and manager for Movement Mortgage. Been in the industry about 17 years. And uh, yeah, still doing lots of loans. So I do all, all kinds, VA, FHA, lots of renovation loans, investors, first time home buyers. I'm a published author, wrote a couple of books on the home buying process that are available at Amazon. If you want to look me up, Quentin J. Hardy, and uh, you can see my author page and the books that I've written so far. Okay. So I want Quentin as a mortgage person to define what is a strong pre-approval for somebody oh. who looking to sell their house in this case mm -hmm. if someone was looking oh from the seller's perspective from the seller's what? perspective i got 12 offers on my table you know at the first open house how do i evaluate the pre-approvals because we're trying to pick the best offer possible for the home seller well very frequently as far as for the seller i'm going to say they really probably need to rely quite a bit on their realtor the, the realtor, and I don't know if that's the answer you were looking for, but the realtor is the expert who's doing this every day, day in and day out, and they are going to know what to look for. So I don't know if the, the seller needs to look at it too much. I do think that one of the things right now that is maybe not accurate is just the fact that you have to make this video. People are looking at a 3% down offer and saying it's weaker than a 20%. It may not be. As a matter of fact, most financial planners, accountants, uh, if people are looking at it from that perspective, when money is cheap, that's when you borrow. That's when you maximize your borrowing. So if I were getting a loan right now as a first time home buyer and I had 50% to put down, I would still put down 3%. I wouldn't want to tie up my money. If I can get interest rates right now just came out of the twos and we're in the low threes. If I could borrow money at the low threes and then have that as a tax write off because it's interest on a home loan for my primary residence, that money is really cheap. I would be better off 
taking my extra thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars down payment and putting that into any sort of investment. I'm not giving investment advice. I'm just saying this is what I would do. I'm better off paying off any other financial obligation or debt that I have that's a higher interest rate, which is probably going to be almost everything. So just because a person's putting down 3% doesn't mean they have only 3%. It might mean that you have a really savvy person who knows what to do with their money and they're trying to minimize their down payment uh, and maximize their loan. And I have people doing that right now. Yeah, that, that is a great point. And I actually have some home buyers doing the same thing. They are, you know, triple A buyers, I would say. They're, they're credit worthy. They have the finances but they spoke to their investment professional and they told them exactly what you're saying with the interest rates being historically low and the market and investing, you know, averaging a significant amount more, uh, at least over a 10 year basis, and you lock in your mortgage for 30 years, that's a significant gain for most people. So definitely that is something to consider for a home seller. Just because it's a 3% down doesn't mean it's the highest risk. They could have a glowing credit report. They could have a large sum of cash reserves in the bank. And yep. they, might be a better, they might be a better risk than the person putting you know 20% down, who that's the only cash that they actually have. They've been saving and that's it. So very good point. Yep. So 3% down mortgage is not always the last resort and it could net you again the sellers it could net you more money at the end of the day and if that's what you're looking for then definitely don't discount those three percent offers on the table great Absolutely. point quentin okay so terms attached and he said as a realtor and yes as a realtor the realtor a good realtor should be guiding their their sellers and their buyers in that case but their sellers on which offer is the best? And the way I critique my offers with my seller, because I educate them, but the bottom line, the, they're the boss and they make the decisions. So look at where these pre-approvals came from. Know the banks where they're coming from. Ask your realtor, have you heard of this bank? If they say no, well, the realtor, I would call up the people and I would speak to the loan officer like Quentin in his case, or some of these uh, internet um, banks where you just type in your numbers and they automatically send you a pre-approval at rocket speed. I'm not mentioning the name of any company, <laughs> but they send you these pre-approvals. I've called some of these banks and I've left messages across the country to a very nice receptionist who promised me that the loan officer will call me back shortly. And I'm still waiting for that return phone call. And that was three months ago. So my point is if, I am the realtor and I'm coaching the sellers on what they should do, which offer they should accept. I'm not gonna tell them to accept an offer from a loan officer, I'm still waiting for a return. If that loan officer picks up the phone, texts me within an hour or two or even three, that same day, uh, then that's somebody I know we can communicate with and I can ask the right questions and then guide and educate my sellers that this is a valid offer because I've spoke to the loan officer in person. And in some cases with permission from the actual uh, buyer, I can ask about their financials and the loan officer with that permission can tell me, oh, they're good for X amount of dollars, which brings us to the next scenario. If they are offering 20 grand above asking price, okay, and that happens in this market, that could be a problem with an appraisal. Now I have made a video, I'm gonna put a link called, you have to sell your house twice with me and an appraiser explaining that the bank needs to make sure that they're taking a risk that if they uh, have to foreclose that they still have equity in that house. So they're not gonna give a loan and Quentin, you can elaborate a little on this. When will a bank give a loan on a property talking appraisal wise as a loan officer? Well, the, the purpose of the appraisal is to make sure the value of the property supports the transaction. So just like you said, it's risk mitigation. We don't want to lend $500,000 on a $200,000 house, for example. So we just want to see the numbers. Now, your question as far as when we will lend, understand that most of the loans, if not all the loans that you're going to be seeing are based on a percentage of the purchase price or the appraised value, whichever is lower. So if someone is buying a $500,000 property 
and it appraises for 520, we're going to use 500,000 as our number. That's the contracted number for, uh, for the down payment, the loan amount, everything like that. Now, if you reverse those numbers, let's say they're buying it for 520 and it appraises for 500. Well, we're gonna give a percentage of the 500. So now their 20% down is based on the 500, et cetera, et cetera, which means the difference between the 500 and the 520, they're going to be short. And what we're seeing in this market because of supply and demand that the, sell, the buyer at that point has to make up that overage. They can pay the extra 20 if they still want the house. And we're seeing that very frequently in the contract. But obviously, like you said, if it's a 3% down buyer, you wanna make sure that that buyer still has the extra 20,000 the extra 20, in this scenario to be able to make that overage, to be able to cover that, that gap. And typically, if I get a phone call from a realtor saying, hey, so how much money does so-and-so have in the bank? We don't give out that information unless we have permission from the buyer. So I would speak to the buyer first and say, hey, I'm getting a call from your realtor or seller, whatever. They're asking how much money you have. Do you give me permission to disclose that because it is private information? Um, most every buyer in that situation would say, yes, I want you to confirm that I have the money. Tell them, you know, show. And so, sometimes even the buyers will send proof of funds and say, hey, here's a bank statement. Look, I got 3%. I got the extra. I got everything. But um, yeah, that's that's where the appraisal and the overage underage is going to be important to consider. And on that note, we talked about in the beginning in my intro, I talked about being attached to anything. And that would be either a house or a lease. Some um home buyers do not want to break their lease because it could be a substantial penalty. If they tell you their lease is expiring in a month or two, not a big deal. Or if they say they don't care, they spoke to their landlord and they're willing to release them from their uh, lease, then they're not really attached to a property. So with that being said, I hope we earned your double thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that little bell down there to get push notifications for future videos. I wanna thank Quentin Hardy from Movement Mortgage. And we'll see you on the next video.